My name is Jeffrey Sidoris, and this is Process Driven. Kevin Mullins never planned on being a wedding photographer, or any kind of photographer, really. His daily routine was a two and a half hour tube ride each way to an IT job in central London. On one particular ride home, he flipped open a magazine someone had left on the seat next to him to an article about wedding photography. The candid black and white photograph struck a chord with Kevin, and when he got home to his wife, he told her that's what he wanted to do. I'll let Kevin fill in the details, but over the past decade, he has shot hundreds of weddings and has developed a terrific documentary shooting style that allows him to forget about the obvious or more traditional shot list, the rings, the cake, the dress hanging in a tree or in front of a window, and instead focus on the smaller personal stories that make up the bigger story of the day. The end results are intimate and allow us as viewers of the pictures to feel more like we were part of the goings-on rather than simply watching them from the periphery. Here's my conversation with Kevin Mullins. Please listen carefully. What are some of the biggest changes that you've noticed in the past 10 years or so in terms of, of expectations that are placed on you as the photographer? Well, I guess the, you know, the hardest thing that we have these days is to compete against the uh, the mobile phones and uh, the smaller cameras. And, you know, there's, there's basically everybody has a camera and, um, you know, the, the the barriers to entry, I guess, from not not just professionally, but everybody at a wedding these days will have a relatively decent photographic device with them of some kind. Sure. Um, and that presents problems not only from a commercial point of view in terms of getting the bookings, but actually on the day because, you know, a lot of the time people are – they have a device in front of their face. And, you know, that's, that's not – I'm not kind of saying that they shouldn't do that because – you know, if we look at historic pictures from the 50s and 60s, people had a newspaper in front of their face all the time. And, you know, it's it's just different means and different mechanisms of uh, communication these days. Sure. Um, but definitely as a as a wedding photographer, it's it's hard to when everybody's connected, everybody's switched on. Um, you know, it's it's you have to look for different pictures. You have to look for things that are truthfully telling the story of the day rather than just pictures of other people taking pictures. That that can be a challenge, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's uh, these days. I think um, I did a wedding about two weeks ago and it was. Uh, one of many that I've done there where they have a what they call an unplugged wedding. So they actually say to their guests, look, you know what? We've got a professional photographer here. Please don't use your phones. Don't use your mobile um, throughout the ceremony. Don't use your kind of pocket cameras. Uh, let Kev do his thing. And later on, if you want to get out, out then fair enough. But, but you know, during the ceremony, just just watch the ceremony, enjoy it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that's really good because then you actually get pictures of the congregation engaging with what's happening in front of them rather than engaging with the device that's in front of them. Sure. Do, do you see that as kind of a trend moving forward? Are more weddings kind of approaching it that way? Um, it's definitely been an upward trend for sure. Mm -hmm. um, however, there seems to be this new kind of trend where people are Instagramming their wedding now. So uh, they will give their, uh, you know, this is the flip side of the coin where they will give their guests a hashtag and, you know, pop it on Instagram with this hashtag as soon as you take your pictures and, you know, we'll get a whole um, documentary basically from our guest point of view right. uh, that we can just collate and, and uh, you know, we can curate it ourselves, but just by searching by that for that hashtag, which I think actually is a, is a phenomenal thing in terms of technology advancement. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the antithesis of a, an unplugged wedding. And, you know, you get some people who are completely, unplugged and some people who are completely technology orientated and you know it's it's just the way we, we live these days and you have to you have to evolve you can't you can't sit back and moan about it because it's that's just the way it is you sure, know there's no sure. point there's no point complaining it. it's that's the way it is and uh, that's the way it will be for the foreseeable future i guess and you know i, I often say to, you know people often say to me oh you know what you what about you know when you're doing street photography for example and you know people are just walking around looking at their phones and and that's not really a uh, you know a street photo and i'm like yeah but actually it is because in in 40 50 years time when people are looking at these pictures they will look at the people looking at their mobile phones and they'll be like whoa hang on, what the hell is that big thing yeah. he's got in his hand you yeah. know it's 
it's a slice of life just as much as the newspaper was 50 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, so it's all fair. It's all, uh, you know, everything is uh, a fair game. And um, yeah, it's it's just different for sure. Than I mean, I started shooting 10 years ago and yeah, it's it's, you know, it's very different, very different. Have the aesthetics changed in terms of, of what brides and grooms are looking for from a wedding photographer a decade ago versus now in your experience? Um, I'm not so sure because most of the people I've been pretty, um, authentic with my style ever since the beginning. Um, so it's documentary approach. And I think the people that kind of gravitate towards that are typically the kind of people who they're one of two types of people. They're either, um, they're, they're kind of older people generally who maybe they've been married before. They, you know, they don't want the the very traditional staged wedding photos mm-hmm. um, or, or they have a perhaps they have a more, uh, I don't know, finer understanding perhaps of uh, photography in terms of a storytelling mechanism. Um, you know, or they are simply, uh, you know, the kind of people who are not comfortable in terms of being photographed. They don't like to, you know, have portraits of themselves, etc. So um, the types of people that typically come to me have always been the same. They, they, you know, they've generally been that type of client. So the aesthetic of what they're looking for, I, I, you know, I'm very um, conscious of my branding and, you know, it's, it's very clear to them from the offset that this is what you're going to get. You're going to get candid storytelling images you're going to get true images from your wedding day they're not going to be contrived they're not going to be set up they're not going to be staged what happens on your day is what's going to be photographed um and so the aesthetic is very honest in that respect and Mm -hmm. of course i'm not saying that any other style is is wrong or you know that it it would be a terrible world if we all shot the same way so it's um it's you know it's good in that respect but yeah the people that typically come to myself and other documentary wedding photographers are people who are you know they're looking for uh, you know authentic images that are not kind of highly processed highly staged and you know they can they can just get on with their day i guess when when you're approaching a client or, or even when a client's approaching you is there a discussion that you have about color versus black and white because this is another thing that fascinates me about your work is it it does have this sort of reportage quality to it so weddings are typically associated with with color i mean mm. l- brides and grooms alike are often very fastidious about color how is it approached in terms of how you photograph to take that color out of the final images well, you know, a majority of the work that I show on my website and my branding is black and white, although mm-hmm. there is a, you know, there's a fair amount of color on there too. Sure. And and the reason for that is because I personally, myself as the as the photographer, I think unless color is the reason I'm taking the picture, then I like to take the color away. And so the story, the, the, uh, the meaning of the picture comes to the fore. Now I'll have to, I'll say exactly the same thing to my clients. So, you know, if they're getting married on a very sunny day and lots of people are outside and there's greenery and there's flowers and, or, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff, then they will get a, a larger ratio of color images because color will be a feature of those images. The sure. reason I'm taking that picture is because it's in color. Um, however, typically, in the uk we don't get that many um sunny days and, really you know, Wait, the, the, say it isn't so <laughs> yeah it's true you, <laughs> as if you didn't know <laughs> um, and and you know and, and the venues are very old they're often dark and you know people tend to have their weddings in you know historical uh, buildings and you know it's it's just not the same as uh, getting married in uh, you know in australia or in california or sure. You know, some you know we don't have um, you know the clients they, they're not going to go up to a top of a mountain and have a beautiful sunset. It just you know it just doesn't happen. So I think there's there's a cultural <clears throat> excuse me a cultural um, effect going on there also. Um, but yeah, I mean the color thing does come up, and and I will speak to them honestly about it. And uh, you know I'll say to them that you know actually if color is important, it will be in color. Um, but you know, leave the rest to me. I'm, I'm the person that's kind of telling the story. Your job as the client is not worry about that. Just enjoy your wedding day and enjoy the pictures afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we, we, you know, it does come up and it comes up fairly frequently and, and I'll just have a conversation with them. And, and you know what, sometimes people will say, actually, you know, we really want everything in color. Um, in which case I'll shoot in raw and I will deliver everything in color and black and white. So they get the best of both worlds. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a possibility. They pay more for that, obviously, but I'm not some kind of, um, 
artistic kind of uh, hideous person who's just going to stand on top of my, my <laughs> chair and go, no, 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 no. My- I shall not deliver color, no. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, absolutely not. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are paying me and uh, feeding my kids. <laughs> right, right. When you're shooting, I mean, one of the advantages to to EVFs and certainly mirrorless cameras is the the ability to see in a different picture profile or, or preset or whatever. Are you shooting in black and white? Are you seeing the wedding in black and white as you're shooting? Yeah, always. Yeah. So yeah. even if I'm shooting raw, um, I have my camera set to black and white film simulation and that helps me see the light better. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's so much easier for me to see the fall off of the light, the gradient, the shadows, the highlights. Um, it, it it removes the clutter of color from my vision. Um, so when I'm shooting, even if I know that the pictures are going to be in color, I'm shooting in black and white. And of course, this is something you can only really do with an electronic viewfinder. Um, you know, you can, I think uh, it's been a long time since I've shot with a DSLR, but I know that you can have live view and use the LCDs, etc. but looking through the viewfinder with a electronic viewfinder and shooting in black and white, knowing that even though you're shooting raw, you're going to get color images at the end of it. It's, it's very liberating because you can, you can, like I say, you can really, really understand the the shadow and highlights better. Yeah. Yeah. There, you know, there, there's a terrific intimacy and I, and I'm sure some of that is, is expected of, of wedding photography, but there's a terrific intimacy that, that you are able to achieve. And I think part of that, when we were talking a little bit at Photokina was that you're using smaller cameras so that you 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 almost aren't noticed uh, when you're sort of walking through crowds. I would imagine that's become more and more refined over the years, yes? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, that's one of my marketing messages also that I will, I will behave like a guest. I will, um, you know, I'll use small cameras. I'll dress like a guest. And to that end, you know, I will things like the X100F and the X Pro2. They are so small I can shoot one-handed, and you know, I'll wander in the drinks reception. I'll I'll have a drink in one hand, uh, or I might have my hand, my other hand in the pocket, and I'll just blend in as much as possible. No. I think it's it's probably disingenuous for me to say that I can be totally invisible because sure. generally I'm the I'm the only kind of single guy there with a couple of cameras. <laughs> but uh, I um, I do my best and and it does allow me to get really close. And I think that uh, you know I like to tell the story from the guest's eye point of view. So I sure. like to deliver images that the guests are seeing rather than the photographer might have seen from, you know, standing on the sidelines with a 200 mil lens, for example. So I use short lenses, short prime lenses. I get right in there, I blend in as much as possible and yeah, do my thing and, and as much as possible, try and just be like somebody else that's at the wedding. Right. So aside from, from the obvious kind of marketing aspect of it, do you see yourself, do you identify as, as, a photojournalist who shoots weddings or are you a wedding shooter who shoots in a photojournalistic style? Is there a difference between those two things? <sighs> That's a really good question, actually. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, my uh, majority of my income comes from photographing weddings. And could I make the same income if I took the wedding element away and was a photojournalist in inverted commons, uh, you know, shooting other stuff? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So uh, by inference, that means that I'm a wedding photographer shooting in a photojournalistic way. Um, However, saying that, I do shoot absolutely everything um, with the same uh, mantra, and that's, you know, candid. So even if it's the kids at home or I'm at a family party or I'm shooting street photography, it's, uh, you know, it's it's candid, it's photojournalistic, and, you know, it's, of course, you don't, you, you're not going to get an award-winning picture every time you raise the camera to your eye, but, uh, you know, it's always based on the, the, the you know, the, the, the holy trinity that I always think of, which is light, composition, and moment, and those three things together are, are what I'm striving to get in every single picture, regardless where I'm t- photographing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Take me back to that that first wedding that you shot. What what was the impetus to go, yeah, this is, I, I think I want to do this? Okay, so we need to go back maybe 11 years or so now. And I was, I was never a photographer, I would have been about 34, 35 years old at that point. 
uh, didn't own a camera, had no uh, inclination whatsoever to be a photographer. I used to play rugby every Saturday, so my Saturdays were pretty sacred to me. And um, I was working in IT in in London, in the city, and uh, you know we'd we'd moved out of London, and I had a two and a half hour commute each way every day, so five hours every day. Oh my gosh! And just yeah, to get to and from big, work. Yeah, oh, to and from work. Wow. And uh, I burnt out. You know, I, I literally, I, I just, the money was good, but there was no way I could I could carry on doing that and uh, remain sane. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I, one day I was sat on the train and I picked up one of the free magazines that they, they, they give out on the tube over here. And I, I just literally opened the magazine to one page. And it was about wedding photography. And uh, I, I very nearly just flicked it over because you know, that didn't interest me whatsoever. And and then I just saw some black and white candid pictures. And they were from a photographer called Jeff Askoff, who was, um, uh, you know, uh, he's not shooting weddings any longer, I believe. But he was a Canon ambassador and he made the most beautiful black and white photojournalistic wedding images. And they were the first ones I ever saw. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I often say to my friends that it's a good job that page on the, wasn't about uh, funeral directing yeah, right. or, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know, something else because, uh, you know, God knows where I could have been now. Right. Um, and, I, and I came home to my wife and I, and I showed her the picture and I said, to her, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. And just, was like, that was it. Just, the, <laughs> it hit you. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, did you even I, own a camera at that point? No, I didn't own a camera. <laughs> I, you know, I had nothing. And and, and that's what my wife said. My wife was. My wife said, "Well, uh, you know, there's a couple of problems here, Kev. Uh, hey, <laughs> you don't have a camera. Uh, you don't know what you're going to do, and, and and you're really miserable. And you're just you just would be a really bad wedding photographer. Wow. Um, were I, were what, you a fan of weddings just a, as an event at the time? No, not really. I mean, I've been to <laughs> weddings, obviously, and uh, you know. But what I liked about it was that, you know, I said to her, I said, yeah, but if you shoot in this particular style that this guy is doing, then, you know, that appeals to me because you don't have to be this gregarious person setting up group shots. Sure, and sure, like sure. And I just didn't, I, I was like, I'd never thought that anything like this even existed. Um, to me, a wedding photographer was, you know, the guy at a wedding that stood on a, uh, a you know, stepladder and bossed everybody around yeah. and told everybody what to do. That was my <laughs> memory of weddings. Uh, and, uh, and and, and know, this this was not the rugby playing IT guy at all. No, this was a very different thing. Yeah, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I'm going to try this, and and I booked on. I in fact I booked onto one of Jeff uh, Jeff Ascot's workshops, and I bought a load of books, and of course I bought a camera, and um, you know we we just had our first baby at the time, so that was my my practice, I suppose, in terms of the pictures and. Uh, I was very fortunate in that because of my IT background, I could get a website up pretty quick. Um, I did a little bit of second shooting from uh, a guy called Steve Corson up in um, Birmingham, very kindly let me come and shoot some weddings with him. And that gave me a portfolio. The website went together very quickly and very easily. And um, I got my first client within, I don't know, maybe two months. Um, and, and uh, how was the experience like that, that first experience, second shooting, did you, did you feel like, did you take to it like a duck to water or was it, was it a, an uncomfortable sort of transition? Um, yeah, it was very weird because, uh, Steve was a really nice guy, a really good wedding photographer, but a, a traditional wedding photographer. Mm -hmm. So the guy um, on the step stool. Uh, yeah, basically. And, uh, and, and, and although he did the candid stuff as all wedding photographers do, um, it was, you know, uh, that element of it was, was what I was trying to get away from. And so, um, you know, I kind of, I concentrated on doing the candids and everything. And, uh, and he, he actually said to me, he said, you'll, you won't get clients that just want candids. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was a challenge and it still is a challenge to a certain extent, but you know, they are right there. And, and yeah, I've, I've been doing it 10 years, 10 years now full time. So, uh, yeah, I guess it worked out. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's, it, it's fascinating to me that it, that you were open to it, you know, that you were open to, to doing something that was so out of what your norm or, or your routine was and taking a chance on that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm a believer in like serendipity and fate and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's an element of that at play and uh, you know, it's definitely, it's empowered. It's, 
it's empowered me to allow my family, which is now obviously bigger than it was then, mm -hmm. to have what I believe is a much better way of life than uh, it could have been if I had that carried on doing the IT stuff. Now, I probably would have been far more wealthy had I stayed in London. Um, but, you know, maybe I mean, been, London's well, an maybe. expensive city, right? True. Yeah. Um, I would have either been a lot more wealthy or dead. One of those two <laughs> things. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh, you know, we have a, we have a, we have a better life. We, we definitely have a better way of life. And of course I still have friends who still do that commute and still do that, that, you know, that, that kind of daily grind and every single one of them are envious of the way that my life has turned out. Um, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's all, it's all roses because there are, you know, I have uh, challenges that they don't have in terms of getting clients and dealing with things and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. And, you know, we, we, we have a good life. We have a, you know, we live in a lovely place and, uh, you know, the, the, the kids are having a good start to their life. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, partly at least due to the fact of this kind of career change. You right, know, and, right. You know, I think it's a good thing. Has your approach changed in terms of what you're looking for over the past decade? I know that weddings have kind of a rhythm to them, but in, in the style that you shoot in, how has your vision or maybe even the types of little details that you look for changed over the past decade? Yeah, I mean, it's weddings are, um, you know, every wedding is very unique, definitely, although they all have a very uh, rigid formula. It's certainly in the UK, at least they have a, uh, you know, there's a there's a structure that they all follow. Mm -hmm. um, and I often say to my clients, actually, you know what, I don't like weddings for that reason. I don't like the structure, the this idea of, um, you know, a, a first kiss and uh, signing the register and cutting a cake and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I, I often say to them, look, you know, the things that interest me are the people and the emotions. And that's what I concentrate on. That's what I will kind of look for when I'm shooting. Um, from a technical perspective, obviously, you have this, you know, the idea of the light composition moment, etc. And, and that's a technical element of things. But the, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the compound images that I want to create, it's, it's about people and it's about um, emotion and interaction between those people. And, uh, you know, the context that they're there is the wedding, but actually it's just people. It's just, I, you know, it's people being people. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I mm -hmm. say to them. Mm -hmm. It's just people being people. I would imagine that there have been occasions where maybe you and the client don't really see eye to eye on one thing or another. And, and you have to maybe say, thank you very much, but I don't think I'm the right person for you. How do those conversations generally go? Yeah, it has happened a couple of times and it's not so much now because I think my my website and everything else that goes around that is pretty obvious mm -hmm. what the clients can expect. But in the past, yeah, I mean, a couple of times we've got maybe six or seven weeks before the wedding and, uh, you know, the emails have come in and, yeah, we you know, we really want the candid stuff, but we also want you know, and they pre present 55 group shots and all of this kind of stuff. And, and, you know, and I've actually had to sit down with them and say, look, I can do this. I'll never say no, but I can do it. But you would be better off getting somebody who can do these things properly because mm -hmm. I can't. This is not my forte. It's not my speciality. Uh, I would rather you actually got a photographer that would be comfortable doing the stuff that you're going to get because I fear that you'll be unhappy with the results. Um, and, you know, only twice, I think that we've, you know, we've come to an agreement and, and I've helped them find another photographer that will do that. Um, and, you know, we've kind of gone our separate ways, but yeah, I mean, by and large, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's plain sailing these days. Mostly everybody is kind of on board. You do get the occasional um, situations where parents of the clients are, have different expectations. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, you know, we, I chat to the clients about that and, you know, explain just, you know, just speak to your mum and dad beforehand. And as long as they're aware of my style, then I'm sure they'll be absolutely fine. And, and they are generally. Is it, seems like the, the, the photojournalistic style or, or, or the more candid approach is becoming kind of a larger pool. Do you feel that way or is it still by and large kind of more niche than mainstream? No, I think I think you're right. I think there's a lot more people doing it. And um, 
you know, I have to be careful of what I say. I'm not, I, I don't want to say that there's a lot more people doing it and a lot of them are doing it badly because mm-hmm. uh, I'm sure people think that I do it badly also. But there, I, you know, I worry that there are people who shoot weddings who think that they're shooting storytelling images, but actually they're just taking 25,000 pictures and, and hoping for the best. Right. Um, you know, and, and like I say, that's, uh, you know, there, there's approaches to everything. And, and I, I actually know people who do shoot 20,000 pictures at a wedding and are very, very, very good at what they do. Um, but I feel that from my point of view, my message to my clients is that I will be as discreet as possible. So the whole idea is that you can have your wedding day without worrying or almost without noticing that I'm there. Mm-hmm. Whereas if somebody is shooting 20,000 pictures, you're going to just have clack, 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 clack all day long in your ear. So, you know, it's different things, different people, people are uh, attracted to different styles, of course. Um, but yeah, I think there are a lot more people doing it. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's good and bad. Competition is a good thing. You know, it opens up the, it opens up the horizons a little bit because brides and grooms can now actually see that as a real style and they've got choice of course, but um, you know, it's, there is a, I used to say that, you know, shooting purely documentary wedding photography was there were less fish to shoot at in the barrel, but those fish were bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, and now the barrel hasn't got any bigger, but there's more smaller fish in there. <laughs> when, so, when did it change? Uh, when did it start to change for you? I think uh, overall, I think when the, uh, you know, which is quite ironic, but I think when the mirrorless revolution hit, I think that had a big impact mm-hmm. because, um, you know, and I do it myself. I think people, uh, they have less reliance now on uh, the, um, uh, understanding the camera functionality they are because of the evf and i use that and because of things like auto iso and i use that um you, you know it's very easy to actually spend your time uh you know just shooting rather than actually understanding the camera and you know i think that's good and a bad thing at the same time but the the cameras have become cheaper the barriers to en- entry the, the cameras are better um they shoot a lot more frames per second the uh, barriers to entry the software is cheaper uh you know it's very easy to do a website etc and you know all of those things benefit me as well so i'm not i'm not kind of saying these are negative things sure um, but it's definitely something that's, uh, you know, changed the equilibrium slightly in the, in the marketplace. Um, and of course I benefit from cheaper cameras too. So it's a good thing. But, uh, you know, when I was, when I first started, I was, you know, my, my, I think I had a Canon 5D Mark one at the time, which was, I don't know, like 3000 pound, whatever. And to have two of those was, you know, a, a substantial investment. And now, uh, you know, obviously I shoot Fujifilm, but the X-T3, which is a phenomenal camera, is now I think one thousand three hundred pounds, something mm-hmm. like that. You know, yeah, so, fifteen hundred you know, US here. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's easier, it's cheaper, um, and I think yeah, I think that's that's kind of tilted the scale slightly. Is is there a danger though? I mean, there's there's pros and cons with everything, right? There's a double edged sword of that where yes, the barrier of entry is is lower in terms of cost, and the cameras do phenomenal jobs with ever more increasingly, you know, sort of complex lighting. But is there a danger that that craft takes a backseat? Yeah, I think there is. And this is why I'm always conscious of talking about the moment, because I think the moment is, you know, the a client, whether it's a wedding photography client or a commercial client or a street photography commission or, uh, you know, a landscape commission for whomever it is, they're, you're being commissioned for what you see through the viewfinder and mm-hmm. not your ability to press the shutter button. Anybody can understand aperture and, you know, uh, shutter speeds and dials and ISO, et cetera. Um, and ultimately it's what you present as your vision that is really should be what the client is attracted to. Of course, things like price and everything else come into it. It has to, because it's, you know, it's economics. Um, but really, you know, I'm, it's important to me that people uh, come to me because they like the pictures that I create, that mm-hmm. I look for mm-hmm. when I'm making a picture. And that's where the artistic style comes into it. And I think that, you know, we're all, everybody is very different, of course, and, and that is a good thing. But I think that, you know, it's, 
again, I, you know, I don't want to sound too negative about the whole kind of shooting hundreds of thousands of images and hoping for the best, because that that is a valid way of shooting. And you know, it's just just because I do it differently is not a, not a negative thing. But I do think that for me, I spend more time composing and looking, watching and waiting. And as much as I'm actually have the camera to my eye, I have the camera down at my side, you know, looking at the characters, watching the play, watching the people, uh, looking at the light, understanding the acoustics in the room, because even things like that means that, you know, you're gonna have people who are more likely to be laughing louder in one end of the room than at the other end of the room. And, you know, it's there's all kinds of things that come into play when you're trying to create a story through pictures than just pressing the shutter button. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. When you're sequencing images for delivery, I would imagine you're also very deliberate in in how you're presenting the images and not just chronologically of how the day is going, but but exploring the different arcs of the story that maybe some guests or even some of the members of the party didn't see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I say, weddings are fairly structured in in kind of the the daily events. But um, you know, it's critical for me to have things like linking images. For example, if I'm going from one venue to the other, I want a something that connects the story. So that could be very simple, such as a car driving past the street sign, or or the street sign itself, or the the, or the venue itself, something like that. Um, but when I'm creating the images for the main part of the wedding, then I'm thinking about, uh, you know, stories within stories. So I will, let's just take, for example, I'm thinking, uh, bizarrely enough, I had a wedding yesterday, which was on Monday. Um, so I'm thinking back to that wedding. And when we are, when they're doing the, uh, the ceremony, I am looking at all angles. So I'm trying to take images of the guests looking through, I'll be shooting through the client's at the guests, often, hopefully it will be the dad or the mum who's watching the, the exchange of the rings, for example. So I'm getting different perspectives there. I'll be doing close-ups of the, the hands and, you know, things like, uh, for example, it's, it seems like such a simple thing, but if you're at the front of the ceremony room, when the bride gets to the front, the very first time the bride and groom touch each other in any kind of way, whether that's, you know, often it's just two little fingers. They just kind of grip each other's fingers mm. just very briefly mm -hmm. nobody nobody else sees that and that is their that's a very very specific personal moment in their own personal history on their wedding day the first time that they've they've connected in any way um and if i can get a picture of that and i know that it's going to happen i can't always get that picture but i know that it's going to happen or the first time they just glance at each other uh you know it's it's those very personal moments in their own history together as, as, a, as you know, this communion of two people and this new family that's being formed that nobody else will see. And, uh, you know, being able to document that and give them that picture. And they're usually the pictures that they kind of smile at the most because mm. they they remember those very, very uh, intimate moments. And it's it's not the traditional, you know, ring or first kiss or cutting of the cake those are you know obvious kind of uh, contrived moments sure if you the, like. the, the shot list pictures yeah, yeah it's, yeah. it's the moments in between they're the ones that, that make me tick and so they're the ones that, that I'm, I'm always looking for when you're doing workshopping and training and, and people come to you and want to learn what do they want to learn do they want to learn the way you do things or is there is there that impetus to just give me the basics so I can go and find my own style? Yeah, I, there's a there's a little bit of both really, and I'm very conscious of saying to the people that I I do tutor that you know this is I can only tell you the way that I do things. Mm -hmm. I cannot I cannot teach you style. I can only teach you I can teach you about business. I can teach you about client acquisition. I can teach you about processing. But I'm very conscious of saying to them that you know you have to find your own personal style and mm -hmm. that even from a documentary point of view because it's you know it's candid shooting can candidly is you know it it's an adjective it's not a style it's 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 an approach right um and your what your vision of the day is you know if if, if you had five wedding photojournalists shooting the same wedding you would hopefully get five completely different views of exactly the same thing and that's a, a very good thing and so you know the the people that i do have on the workshops of course they are often 
they're you know they're intrigued by the style and you know especially the guys starting out right at the very beginning of their of their careers um but it's very important for me to say to them look you know this is uh you, you know this is not a belts and braces template this isn't you, you know this is not a blueprint to shoot exactly the same as i do sure i can i can get you on the ladder i can help you out but you have to see you know you, you, your eyes are different to my eyes and that's the most important thing well and it often style appears in hindsight Right. I don't I don't know that you can set out and go, well, I want my style to be this, you know, quite right. Yeah. Uh, and my style has changed over the years. Definitely. I mean, it's even though it's been predominantly candid, even from the beginning, the the approach that I've taken, uh, you know, you, you get braver, you get closer, you, 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 you have a more clear understanding of. Uh, humanity, really, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how people interact with each other. In the early days, I had no idea about that. And so, yeah, you do, you do build on that as you, as you move forward, for sure. Yeah. Was there a turning point for you where you saw a definite, not even style, but point of view emerge as you were, as you were photographing weddings? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Well, uh, one of the things that I remember vividly happening was when I definitely had the confidence to move into the wedding while I would class as shooting the wedding from the inside out rather than the outside mm, in. Mm -hmm. Rather than being um, on the periphery. Okay. Okay. Correct. Yeah. And uh, even when I shot DSLR, I pretty much shot with two cameras, one with a, in full frame terms, a 35 mil lens and one with an 85 mil lens. And now I shoot APS-C. i pretty much shoot the same. So in my world, it's now 23 mil and 56 mil. Mm -hmm. um, but that 23 mil focal range or 35 in um, full frame equivalent is, uh, I shoot a vast majority of my images with that. And I do, you know, remember having this kind of compulsion, if you like, to to really start telling images or making images that were from a guess eye point of view, rather than, you know, I felt that my images were too wide and too broad and they were, that they were panoramic images. There was no, you know, there was a lot of context to them, but it was, you know, it wasn't really getting the the, the nitty gritty of the wedding up close and personal. Um, so, and this this happened before I moved to mirrorless cameras. This was when I was still shooting with my DSLRs, and you know, I did, you know, I do remember kind of making that that conscious effort to be more. Um, more brave, more considered. Um, of course, in no, back then I was using a Canon 1D Mark IV, which um, was huge. Yeah, <laughs> right. Camera, yeah, yeah. But huge, you know. Um, so kind of getting formidable in somebody's there. face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so that presented me with different problems, and and you know, and obviously that was one of the reasons why I moved on to to kind of smaller cameras in the end. But yeah, I mean, it was a fantastic camera. I loved that that Canon 1D Mark IV. But yeah, it wasn't really. You know, it, it was the the thing that was blocking me from doing what I really wanted to do, and I didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. When did it When did it change? When was it an immediate change when you went to a smaller system that that you started feeling more comfortable close up? Yeah, I, it was pretty much a media. It was, um, I got the original Fujifilm X100. Mm -hmm. um, so this was back in 2012, I guess, 2011, 2012. And um, I took it, it arrived one morning and I, I had a wedding that afternoon and I took it with me to the wedding. And the original X100 was, and I still have that very camera and I still use it actually, um, but it was slow and <laughs> it was, you know, for every picture you had in focus, you'd have five out of focus. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's the updated firmware to make it a little bit better, but it was, it was a very challenging camera. But the one thing I knew within an hour of starting to use that camera was that this was definitely the way forward because I could suddenly see in the viewfinder what the image was going to be for a start in terms of the electronic viewfinder. But also people were, uh, they were, they were, I, I they were dealing with me differently. No longer was, you know, when I put the, the, the big DSLR down and I just wandered into the wedding reception, with this tiny camera, um, people were just, uh, you know, it was a very, very different approach and their reactions were different and they didn't notice I had the camera and, you know, uh, occasionally people would start talking to me about the camera and, you know, it was just different. It was remarkable. And, and I was definitely 
that was the turning point for sure, like 100%. And, um, you know, it happened to be a Fujifilm X100. It could have been a Leica. It couldn't have been a Leica because I couldn't afford one. Yeah, but right. it, could have, it could have been any other camera at the time. For, for the 10 people that could afford the Leica, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was, you know, it was just that it was a smaller camera that made the, the difference for me. And, uh, yeah, it was it was a, a massive thing. And I, I felt like I started enjoying it rather than seeing hmm. it as a, as a chore. And it sounds like the, the pictures that you were able to get changed as well. And that was more encouragement to, to continue sort of deeper down that rabbit hole. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, when you're editing wedding pictures and which, you know, obviously I do a lot when I find, I find myself smiling at the pictures again, because mm. they are pictures that I would love if it was my own wedding. Yeah. Um, it's no longer, you know, don't get me wrong. I don't look at every single picture and think, oh, that's great. You know, <laughs> pat I, yourself I, on I, the back. <laughs> yeah, I have my own demons <laughs> for sure. But I, um, uh, I definitely feel that I can make pictures that are, you know, if I like them, then presumably the client's going to like them also. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's a good thing in my mind. You know, it's funny. You, I, I've talked to a lot of photographers and it doesn't matter what level, and I've got my air quotes going, what level a photographer or an artist or a musician or anybody's at, there is still, you just mentioned it, there are still those demons about this isn't any good, my work's not, I don't deserve, whatever it is, imposter syndrome, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Does it ever get easier for you 10 years in? Or does that, I would imagine it still rears its head from time to time. Yeah, no, it's worse. Um, it's it, worse. Uh, yeah, it's it's much worse for me because, um, and I don't know whether that's just me personally or whether all photographers go through this, but yeah, I, I mean, I have a very, uh, it's hard because I uh, because of my I, um, my relationship with Future Film and the ambassador thing, there's a lot of eyes on my work, yeah, <laughs> a lot, um, and you know, every single time I put a picture up, uh, I have to be wary that it's not just clients, potential clients that are seeing that, it's thousands potentially of other, other photographers who will all have their own very, uh, uh, very own opinions of, of that picture. And so, uh, yeah, I'm very fearful of it. And, uh, and um, it is, you know, my wife always says to me, you know, you do, you, you have that fear that sometimes somebody's going to say, hang on, why, you, you know, how is this happening? <laughs> Who's this you? guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where's, where, you know, all this stuff. And, um, yeah, and, and and it is a it's a big thing, definitely, and and I'm not ashamed to say that. And but at the same time, I think it's good that I'm not complacent. I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, Does it change know, the way you shoot? Given given that, that that there are more potentially more eyes on your photos, does it change the way you you shoot? No, now that is a very good point, and a very uh, and it's it's a great it's a great conversational piece because. It used to. I used hmm. to. I used to shoot weddings and think uh, these. I want to make pictures for my blog post, or I want to. I want to enter pictures into a competition. Really? Now, uh, yeah, and I think all photographers go through that period. Um, and then all of a sudden, I kind of, I kicked myself, uh, you know, at the backside. I, I stopped entering any competitions. I don't know, you know, I didn't, I didn't do any of that stuff any longer um, because. I absolutely 100% believe that when I'm taking pictures on the wedding day, the only person that has to be happy is the client. Mm -hmm. And whilst, of course, I, uh, you know, I have my um, training and my workshops and all of that kind of stuff, and you know, and, and I'm grateful for that. It's the client; they are the most important people. And I, you know, I, I remember mentoring a photographer for a while, and. And uh, and she called me up one day and she said, uh, you know, I've got these clients who, you know, I, I, they they don't want me to use any of the pictures on on my blog. Um, and I spoke to her about this and I was like, well, okay, you know, you if if all of the clients didn't want us to use pictures on the blogs, then that would be a problem because obviously that's where the marketing comes from. Mm -hmm. But what what are you worrying about? Are you worrying about the fact that? They are, you know, you you might get some really good images that will be portfolio specific, or are you worrying about the fact that you won't be able to enter a competition or anything like that? And and she actually said to me, I, you know, there's this really really great, uh, it's a, it was a you know, famous church in the UK, really great um, picture uh, that I I want to get going because I've seen similar pictures in the Fearless Awards, 
uh, and the fearless awards is a you know big wedding industry awards kind of thing mm -hmm. um and so i said to her well you know i think you're you're approaching it wrong because yeah of course you know winning awards are great but ultimately you know, you're you're approaching that wedding for your own gratification from an awards point of view, rather than, you know, from the wedding point, from the client's point of view. Now, of course, if you get award-winning pictures or you get portfolio pictures from the wedding, that's a bonus. It should never, in my opinion, should never be the reason for shooting it or taking it or taking on the commission in the first place. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I no longer think, um, again, I have to be cautious what I say. I, I no longer, when I'm shooting, I'm no longer thinking, what would other photographers think? It's, I'm thinking, what do the clients think? That, mm -hmm. And that's really, really important for me, really important. Um, well, it yeah. sounds like it was a pretty major turning point having that, that kind of realization, you know, that uh, just being present enough to go, here's what I'm doing and, I need to course correct a little bit. Yeah, it was like an epiphany, really, I guess, because you, you know, you still obviously every time I still put a blog post up or I put something on Instagram, you know, I still have that kind of, <laughs> you know, imposter syndrome thing. But I, I, I no longer, I, I, I'm never going to mitigate what I'm doing uh, at the wedding for the sake of, uh, you know, an award or for the sake of uh, perfect blog pictures or, you know, anything like that. And it's, you, you can't, you know, when you're shooting candidly, you, you can't, you can't say to the clients, look, this would be a really good candid picture if you suddenly dropped your drink or, you know, or, <laughs> right. or we get somebody to come into the room or whatever. <laughs> this um, would be a really good candid picture if you could just dot, dot, dot. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's great. exactly. You know, and, uh, and, again, and it's why I use the word candid. It's because candid is an adjective. You know, you, you either shoot candidly or you don't. There's no middle ground. There's no, the moment you interact with it, then it's not candid. And and some people will say that, you know, actually just by being at a wedding, it's it's not candid because the actual event itself is staged. And that's a very valid point. But I think, you know, within the, each image within that day, um, then, you know, you have to kind of bring it into the context of the, uh, of the environment you're in. But yeah, I mean, Certainly, you know, uh, there are people definitely that stage candid pictures um, just for the sake of winning these awards. Um, and, you know, that's fine if the clients are on board and, and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, but I, I just, you know, I always think the client has, you know, if I said to a client, I'm going to be a candid wedding photographer, and then on the day I started telling them what to do, they <laughs> hold on, they would just, yeah, exactly. What's going on here? This is not what we signed up for. Um, and you know, however, you know, again, obviously, if if somebody says to them, hey, you know what, I shoot in a natural way, but I will gently direct you on the day, etc., and the clients are aware of that, then everybody's a winner, of course. Then that's you know, that's that's good client expectations. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Candid is an adjective and it's, uh, you know, it's either candid or it's not. <laughs> right. How do you, how do you deal with being directed? I would imagine that there, there are those occasions where you're asked more or less gently uh, to do a certain shot or to get a certain angle or to be a certain place. How do you, how do you kind of push back on that? If at all. You know, it doesn't really happen. The, the only the only time that um, anything like that kind of comes up is if we do any kind of group shots. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, of course, I say, of course, I will still do group shots and I will keep them uh, two, three, max, maximum three these days. Um, and I would say probably 60 percent of weddings still want one or two group shots um but by and large the clients are now you know their brand the brand has worked and some the clients that don't want that which is great and usually it's only in that circumstance it's only on that part of the day where they might say how do you want us to stand and and, and my answer is always the same i just say however you're comfortable right. i'm just gonna i'm just gonna press the button when you're ready um and i so even for things like group shots, I won't have any interaction as such. I'll just stand at the front and click that button. Um, to that end, you know, I will, uh, I shot a wedding a couple of weeks ago and, and a good friend of mine came as a second shooter because the client was adamant that they really wanted me, but they, they really wanted, uh, um, in the end, they wanted 10 group shots. And 
I said, look, you know, you, you, the option you have really is if you want me to do what I do best, you need to pay for a second shooter to come to do those group shots. And I will be able to shoot around that moment and get the, the, the moments in between those group shots, et cetera, while he's doing that stuff. And that worked really well because they, they still got what they wanted. And I still managed to, you know, to, to kind of be released to shoot the, the story that was evolving around those group shots. Sure. One of the things I, I really have, have found in looking through your work that I kind of am drawn to is the environment around the wedding. You spend a good deal of time sort of setting up the event or setting up the, the, the location, providing context, whether it's a little town or the building itself or, or just little ancillary details that add color, even if it's in black and white, but add sort of uh, contextual color to the image. Has that always been kind of there as a part of, of, of how you approach them? Yeah, I think um, I remember when I was uh, when I was in school, uh, I actually I wanted to be a journalist, a newspaper journalist. That's mm. what I wanted to be. I, I never went that direction. But um, I remember going on a uh, work experience, the local newspaper. And the, the journalist I was with for the week said, you know, a story like any story, whether it's a short story in a newspaper or it's a, a, a full book or whether whatever it is, it, it has to have a start, a middle and an end. And each part of those, each section has to be linked. There has to be something that connects those things together. Otherwise, it just doesn't doesn't support itself. Um, and I, I think that's true with 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 pictures as well. If you're trying to tell a story, um, you know, you have to include details, you have to include the environment, you, and whether that's simple images of, uh, you know, the, the bridal car leaving and the church in the background, or, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But there, there has to be, in my mind, at least ways to connect that start, middle and an end. Sure. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something I learned from that, that journalist. And, and that's, that's, you know, it's, it's a common thing. It's an obvious thing to say, but it's, you know, just because they're visual, just because they're pictures, they still, and if you're telling a story, you still need that, that, you, you know, you need to follow those rules, start, middle and end and, and link those things together. But, and a lot of those pictures, the, the contextual pictures, they don't look obvious. If you, if you look at them by themselves, uh, there, there's one wedding, I don't remember whose it was, but there are pictures of sort of pigs through through a, a hedge and and pictures of uh what looked like these little uh oh gosh they looked like almost like probably the wrong term but like a gypsy trailer or something like a caravan yeah. type thing mm -hmm. and those photographs stand on their own as interesting photographs but then woven through the story of the wedding they provide this this context that as a viewer gives me a little more connection to that body of work to that event yeah, absolutely. And, and I think also it's worth, you know, it's worth remembering that the, the clients will see those things on the day as well. And so you're kind of curating these memories that mm -hmm, will take them mm -hmm. back to think, oh, yeah, do you remember we had the, the gypsy vans right outside, et cetera, and, and the, the, the piglets and uh, all that stuff. And, you know, one, one picture I always refer to when I'm talking about this is I shot a wedding at Stonehenge. Um, Heard and of it. And <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, Stonehenge. Um, <laughs> and um, it's... The client, the wedding was at dawn. It was like five thirty a.m. in the morning, and we, I didn't want to just give them a picture of the venue, the the stones, because there are a billion pictures of stones of the Stonehenge on the on the internet, etc. You know, there's nothing. Taking a picture of the Stonehenge is not going to remind them necessarily of sure. their wedding. Yeah, you're not bringing anything new to that conversation with that. Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. the picture that I ended up taking, and it wasn't something that I planned, but the picture I saw on the day was when we, the, the, I don't know if you've ever been to Stonehenge, but you turn up and they, they take you up in a bus and then you get off and then you have to walk, you have to approach the stones. So I saw the clients and they had their children with them. They were approaching the stones. So I stood back and I, and I actually shot it on my little X70, which is a uh, has like a 21 mil lens. So it's quite wide or wider. Um, so the stones are in the foreground, oh, sorry, in the background, and the clients are approaching the stones. And so it's one of the images on, on the front page of the website. Mm -hmm. but it's, yeah, a little boy in a red cape, I think. Yeah, correct. Yeah. The, the little boy, bless him. He was dressed as Thor, of course. Oh, as one uh, does. You know. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, I was, it's one of my favorite pictures because, it, uh, you know, it really, it really sets the scene. It's them approaching this 
uh, you know, destiny is, is probably far too much of a, a fanciful word to use, but it's them approaching this place that they're going to, you know, uh, put their lives together in the, in these stones. And, and they're in the scene. It's, it's scene setting. There's context. It's wide. You have the venue, which was the stones. You have them and their children. It's in color because color was important because of the little boys, the little boys cloak. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, that's a classic example, I think, of the stuff that I try and look for. Um, but of course, it doesn't always work out, you know, and, and, and you never know because when you shoot, you know, in an off the cuff way, you don't know what's going to happen when, you know, I, I, you don't know whether it's going to be raining or the, the bus is going to take you right to the stone. You, you just can't plan for it. It's it's only what you see on the day that that can kind of come into your mind. And, and you know, I really like that picture because of that element. Yeah, there's a terrific uh, there's a terrific presence to it. How big of a part does social media play in in your business? Because you, you hear from from photographers that it can either be a blessing or a curse. What is it for you? How important is it? Um, yeah, I think generally, I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, a lot of my work comes from social media. Instagram actually drives quite a lot of business my way these days. Hmm. Um, but on the flip side, you have to be on top of it. You have to, you know, you have to take control of it. Um, but it's business, isn't it? It's just yeah. marketing. And, um, you know, I always say to people that if you – if you do not have the physical capacity to do websites, social media, blogging, Instagram, all of that kind of stuff, then unfortunately you will have to get somebody to do it for you because you, you just cannot stand still and, and not have it these days. Um, but yeah, I think overall I quite enjoy it. I, you know, I actually enjoy, you know, putting content on my website and blogging and writing and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I think that, yeah, it's, you're right. It's a double edged sword. Some people really, really despise it. And I'm very conscious that, um, yeah, I think a lot of photographers forget the word social in social media. Sure. And they replace the word social with guerrilla marketing. Yeah, right. Look what I've done. Um, look what I've done. Have yeah, I mentioned what I've done? Look at what I've done. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and and if you put your, if you put your you know if you put yourself in the shoes of a client or a potential client who you know if they stumble across something on Instagram and and all they see is a thousand hashtags, you know hashtag white wedding hashtag wedding hashtag white hashtag white shoes hashtag shoes wedding shoes blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's like whoa why are you shading all this stuff at me so you know I I always uh, especially with Instagram I you know I keep my hashtags two three hashtags maybe four max right I tell I tell a story I describe it. Um, and unless it's a, uh, a kind of camera specific post, I tell the story uh, as if I'm talking to potential clients, not other photographers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that's I think a nice uh, demarcation of, of really realizing who your audience is that you're talking to. It's important. Yeah, it is important. And, um, you know, we all we all have to pay the bills. And I think, yeah, just remembering that you know, social media is about social and right, it's about right, right, clients. Right. That's the key thing. Yeah. Definitely. What's been more difficult for you learning and refining the craft of photography or embracing and learning the business side of making it work as a, as a business? Um, I think the business side of thing came quite naturally to me. I mm. mean, I, you know, I've run several businesses in the past, small scale businesses, nothing kind of like this. So I'm happy with, with the business side of things and, and the way that that works. However, the, the constant change in the shifting of the sands in terms of marketing is a challenge for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess, yeah, for me, when I first picked up a camera and was like, you know, what do you do? You know, that, that, that was definitely a challenge. And, I don't ever want to be the person that doesn't stop learning though. You know, I, 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 I'm always conscious of being complacent and, uh, you know, we all have weddings where we come back and think, ah, oh, you know, I could have done that a little bit better or this didn't go so well, but you know, I, I, I really, really try at every single wedding and, uh, and I'm consciously when I'm doing my street photography, for example, I do that not to make money, but to, to teach myself things, to do, whether that's just teaching myself more about human interaction or whether it's to teach myself more about composition or lines, shapes, geometry, uh, whatever, the times of the day that light has fallen, anything, you know, it's, uh, that is a, is an ongoing 
um, challenge and, and, and it's an enjoyable challenge and one that should, should definitely never stop. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, it's important to love not only what you're shooting as a business, but I would imagine that the street photography really does help keep that vision sharp and, and that vision constantly sort of, you know, thirsty for new material, for new input. Yeah, definitely. And I, you know, I happen to enjoy it, which is great. Um, but, you know, I think uh, we may have mentioned it earlier. I, you know, I, I, I've, I, I have friends who shoot weddings on a Saturday and then they put their cameras down and they pick the camera up again the Saturday after. And they just, you know, it is a job. Their job is to take pictures and they're good at it. You know, they're very good at it, but they don't have a passion for it. They don't have a passion for photography as such. They have a passion for perhaps weddings or wedding photography or making money, mm -hmm. but they do not have a passion for the art of photography. And, and, and I, you know, that's something I definitely would never want to happen. I want to... I want to love taking pictures of whatever it is, you know, and whether that's my kids, street photography, uh, you know, uh, I'm in a, a, a collective of photographers and we, we create essays, monthly essays where we, you know, and it's, it's a challenge sometimes. And sometimes it's little things like, you know, we'll take 12 pictures of the scene that is right in front of us, whatever that may be. And, uh, you know, it's, it could be a, you know, the food or your, your workspace, whatever, but it's, it's making um, something interesting out of everyday objects that that you know that intrigues me, and and I think that's the passion of photography is is something that's uh, was never there naturally. I didn't like I said I never you know I'm not one of these guys who uh, you know when my dad gave me a camera at the age of four I knew I was going to be a photographer. <laughs> Right. <laughs> didn't happen. Hey, my dad gave me a camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And, uh, don't get me wrong. I wish my dad did give me a camera at right, the age of right. four, and perhaps I would have started before the age of thirty-five. But um, it, you know, that just wasn't my background, and yeah. so um, you know, I just love it. I just love. I still love the pictures. I love taking pictures, and uh, I never want that to to stop ever. You know, I just would hate that. I, I love your approach, uh, and it sounds like the best thing that 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 at least professionally and maybe even personally, other than obviously your family that, but it sounds like one of the best things that, that could have happened that day on the tube. Life changing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, definitely life changing. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's unfathomable to think that I could be going back and spending, uh, you know, again, I'm conscious of not putting this rose tinted glasses on everything because, you know, we all, we all have our own challenges in life, but sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's worked. We've got a young family and my, um, you know, I, it's hard to, my, I, my wife does not have to go to work, um, uh, to bring money in, <laughs> yep. but she works very hard, uh, you know, in the family and the house and all of that kind of stuff. And, and without her, I definitely couldn't do the things that I do. Um, but the income, I make enough income from wedding photography to support this lifestyle. And, um, you know, it's, it has peaks and troughs, you know, and some years are better than others, but yeah, definitely it's, it's phenomenally better than, than it could have been. I think. Was there a fear of making that change or was there so much excitement that you didn't even think about it? You just knew I need to try this because it sounds like it's the latter, not the former. Um, there was a fear, but yeah, no, it was definitely a case of, I want to do something that's going to make a better way of life. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this was, this was the opportunity that presented itself, but it was fearful, um, because, uh, you know, we didn't have money in the bank. It was, it had to work. And, uh, you know, I had my skills, uh, the IT skills behind me, but if so, if it didn't work, I knew that I could always kind of go back to doing that. Sure. Um, but I, you know, it wasn't like we had two years worth of savings that, that we could have, you know, it had to work from the start. It had to start making money. And in that very first year, I shot uh, seven or eight weddings, which kind of got us through. And then the second year, it had to be the, it had to bring the money in. Um, and then that second year, I shot 69 weddings, which oh my God, Kevin. <laughs> nearly killed me. Um, how, but, do you, how do you even do that? That's a, astonishing. Yeah, the the way you do it is by not charging enough, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and then realizing <laughs> that's an interesting thing. I mean, I don't know if this if this translates into the UK, but in in the US, there's this idea that there's there's no love in the middle. Either you 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 charge low and you make it on volume, 
or you charge high and become a, a, a sort of niche uh, boutique quantity. But in the middle, there's, there's too much work that you have to put in to make it work. How do you balance that? How did you figure out this is where I need to be in this marketplace to make it work for us? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're dead right, and actually, it's the same here in terms of that that, that analogy. Um, but one of the things that I I, uh, you know, I was very conscious of right at the beginning was that it's a business, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's ninety five percent business, five percent taking pictures. Yeah, sadly, but that's the case. Um, so after that first year, we I actually sat down and did a business plan and. I approach business plans the same way as I used to approach IT projects. And you, you start at the end, basically. So let's just say the IT project is to create a reporting system. Mm -hmm. You need to know what the report you need to deliver is going to be before you start designing the, the tools. You know, that's you need to know what the output is before you can start designing the stuff that's going to create that output. Sure. So I needed to know, you know, how much money I needed on a monthly basis, what the holidays were going to be, you know, medical insurance, all of that kind of stuff. So by knowing those figures up front, that was my benchmark. That was that I knew that what I had to charge to get to that level. Um, now, in the beginning, back in those days, it was a lot easier than it is now for people entering the marketplace because there was a lot less wedding photographers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you could, you know, we had the we had the benefit of being able to kind of look at the business, look at the value, uh, look at the economics of it, and then say, right, this is the price that I need to charge. To in order to make this this comfortable living, um, now of course I don't drive around in a Porsche. I don't you know I don't we, you know I don't fly first class or anything like that. But but Kevin, you're you're a Fuji ambassador. I mean, isn't that the perception? <laughs> it might be the perception, yeah, but it's it's definitely not the true case, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, for example, it, it, today I sent back my. Um, GFX 50R prototype and also the XT3 prototype. And this morning I put in an order uh, for uh, an XT3 because I want an XT3 and I've had to buy it, you know, and 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 that's the right thing. It's the right thing. I have to, you know, it's it's wrong that people assume that I get free things to say mm -hmm. good stuff mm -hmm. because that's just not true. And, and isn't that and, yeah. isn't that kind of disheartening? It's almost cynical that that the only reason that you're going to sing the praises of a tool that you use is because you're being compensated like that. That's our first, that's our, and it's collective. It's our first response. Like, Oh, well he's getting paid or she's getting paid. Yeah. And I think that, uh, I, to be honest with you, I understand people's, uh, you know, a vision of that. I, I can understand why people think that I, I definitely can understand that. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I have a good relationship with Fujifilm. I will do workshops for them and, you know, I'll go to places like Photokina and all that kind of stuff, but they pay me for that. It's a business relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, they're not going to pay somebody to go who is uh, unhappy with their camera equipment, but, you know, I'm very honest in my reviews. I always say that, uh, you know, this is from a working point of view. And if, uh, you know, something comes along that I think will allow me to deliver better work for my fee paying clients, which are the wedding clients, then I'll move. And Fujifilm know that. I know mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and hopefully enough photographers now know that also. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I have a, you know, it's a very symbiotic relationship. I will say the negative things about cameras, you know, for example, when the X-H1 came along, I didn't particularly like it. I, you know, I didn't like the size, didn't like the ergonomics and, you know, I didn't buy it. And, you know, I, I, I openly said that. Um, and I think that, you know, if you're an ambassador, you have to have integrity. There is absolutely no point not having integrity because then people will just totally ignore whatever you say. Sure. Sure. Has the fact that you are an award-winning ambassador, does that help in the day to day or is it something that just looks good on the website? Um, I don't think it helps in the day to day because I don't think, you know, when a wedding client comes along, they get, you know, they enter this wedding bubble. They're in this bubble for maybe 18 months, two years. When they first enter this bubble, they go onto the internet and they type in wedding photographer. Mm -hmm. They don't type in future film ambassador or they don't right, right. type in award winning. <laughs> Not that you know of anyway. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, don't get me wrong. It is, it's a good thing to have as my tagline. And when they start researching me and they see that I'm, you know, I'm affiliated and stuff like that, then of course that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but 
you know, if they stumble across another wedding photographer who's not an ambassador of any kind or doesn't have any kind of social footprint, but they like their pictures better, then they would. it's right that they go to yeah. that photographer. At the end of the day, it's, a, it's about yeah. the pictures. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Is, is it, I mean, again, kind of going back to your, your mentorship and, and training, is that something that new photographers are able to hear? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I, like I say, it's, uh, you know, the business of photography is an important thing for people to get right, because a lot of people get that wrong at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it has to be about the, the images, correct? And, uh, you know, the style and your approach to it, and the, the, the types of images that you enjoy creating, you have to align yourself with clients that enjoy those types of images, too. Um, I mean, if I had a dollar or a pound for every person that came to me and said i really want to shoot documentary wedding photography and then i look on their website and the first picture i see is may well be a very beautiful portrait or a picture of a wedding dress hanging from a tree or something and it's the complete antithesis of the type of stuff that they want to shoot mm -hmm. but they don't have the confidence to you know if i take that off then i won't get any clients and i'm like well that may be true, but if you keep that stuff on there, you will only get the, the types of clients that want the stuff that you're showing them, you know, and you have to really enjoy it. Nobody wants to come back from shooting a wedding on a Saturday and hate what they've been doing. It's, uh, you know, it, it's just soul breaking and you will not be in the business for very long. So, um, you know, it's, it's six or one and half a dozen of the other, as we say over here, that, you know, you have to you have to find that line, that medium ground where you, you know, you find clients that are attracted to the type of stuff that you want to shoot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and like I said earlier, it, it would be a terrible world if we were all the same. So luckily, there are lots of people who produce beautiful formal wedding photography. Many of them are good friends of mine. And there are many clients that want that. So for every client that comes to me, stumbles across my website, and presses the, the 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 contact form button, there may be 10, 20, 30, I don't know, however many that go on there and go, hmm, yeah, actually, we don't want that. Right. You know? We do want something a little different. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I'm always, it's always in the back of my mind is when my clients pick up their wedding book in, I don't know, let's just say 40, 50 years time and uh, with, their, with their children and their, their kids' children, their grandchildren and stuff, I want them to look at the pictures and think, oh, yeah, do you remember when Auntie Maud did that? Rather than think, oh, yeah, do you remember when that photographer made Auntie Maud do right, that? Right, right, right. <laughs> that's, that's like super important to me. Right. It's, and it seems like such a simple thing. Um, but I don't want, I don't even brand my albums. They don't have my logo on them. They don't have hmm. anything because I just want it to be about their pictures. And that, that might sound kind of counterproductive from a marketing point of view. And it might even sound a little bit self-indulgent, but it's not meant to be. It's It, it can't really all is. be about marketing though, can it? I mean, it, it, no. it, it really loses something if, if everything is just about perpetuating that next thing. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, we, of course we have to, we have to market, we have to do the thing, but it, it has to be, passion has to underlie, underlie it all. It, you know, it has to, um, otherwise you'll just be the board photographer at the wedding, you know, not doing anything and just kind of getting the record shots that, that, you know, are expected and, and you won't be doing it for very long. Simple as that, because, you know, it's, it's a lonely world being a wedding photographer, I can tell you. And it's, you don't want to be, you know, you want to be, excited by it you want to be uh, excited by the opportunities the the creative or otherwise you know the, the 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 these moments in time that are unfolding in front of you are unique and you are or are you know one is the curator of those memories you know you're the person putting this story together that is going to be a, a an heirloom for their family hopefully um and you know it would it would break my heart if uh you know, some of the, the more like the hugging when people are hugging each other and stuff like that, it would, it would break my heart if those moments just didn't like were wiped from history, you know, like, uh, like back to the future, you know, where these, these people just start disappearing from the pictures because the interaction of the photographer, you know, so, you know, going up to somebody and saying, right, you know, you stand there, you do this, now look at each other, smile, cry, whatever, and, and not allowing these, these very 
basic human instincts of emotions to just happen as they are meant to happen naturally uh that that you know that just doesn't sit with me um but that's my style it's not just because it's my style it doesn't mean it's right or the only way but that's that's the way that my internal body ticks when i'm shooting a wedding if you would like to see some of kevin's terrific work or book him for your upcoming wedding visit kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk. That's K-E-V-I-N-M-U-L-L-I-N-S photography.co.uk. You can also find him on Instagram at Kevin Mullins Photography and on Twitter at Kevin underscore Mullins. Subscribe to Process Driven in your favorite podcast app or subscribe to the new Jeffrey Sidoris Everything feed and get all of the shows and conversations that I produce, including Process Driven and Iterations, in one feed. You can connect with me on Instagram or Twitter at Jeffrey Sedoris. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S. And you can take your photography knowledge a little deeper with my book, Photography by the Letter. More than 170 terms defined and explained with the help of original photographs and diagrams, answers to common questions, helpful tips and exercises, and interviews with six terrific photographers. Get it as a paperback or a downloadable ebook at photographybytheletter.com or jeffreysedoris.com. And as always, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I hope you had a great time. I know I did. And I hope you'll come back for the next one. 